Hey everyone, good afternoon, good early evening, depending on where you're joining us from today. Um, let's get started. If everyone wants to put in the chat where they're tuning in from today, be sure to direct that to all panelists and attendees so everyone can see. And we will get started as those start to roll in. It's always nice to see where people are coming from this afternoon. And in the meantime, I'll get started with some brief announcements. Welcome everybody and thank you for joining us today at the Northwestern Alumni Association um, Experts Live, Where Do We Go From Here? A conversation with Angela Jackson and Parnisha Jones. This event is held in conjunction with the Northwestern University Libraries, Northwestern Uni University Press and National Poetry Month, which is now in April. My name is Jenna Martin. I am the Associate Director of Alumni Engagement at the Northwestern University Alumni Association. Before we begin, a few housekeeping items. Just so you all know, the NU Press is offering a special 30% discount for the month of April. The discount code is Jackson. Books are limited to 10 per customer and you could visit nupress.northwestern.edu to view Angela's books. I encourage everyone to ask your questions at any point during the presentation today using the Q&A tab at the bottom of your screen. My colleague will be facilitating those and some of the pre-submitted questions at the end of the presentation. I would also like to point out that we have, are using the audio closed captioning today, but you are free to turn it off on your own device by hovering over the live transcript icon at the bottom of your screen. Now I would like to welcome Sandy Riggs, who will be introducing our presenters today. Sandy Riggs is a volunteer extraordinaire for the Northwestern community. She is a member of the Women's Board, alumni of Northwestern, Block Museum Board of Advisors, and the Library Board of Governors. As a volunteer for the NAA, she is a member of the Rogers Society and has co-chaired many of her class reunions. So now I'm gonna turn it over to Sandy. Thank you, Jenna. I'm Sandy Riggs and as a member of the Library's Board of Governors and co-chair of the Outreach Committee, I warmly welcome you all to today's program. And what a wonderful program we have in store for you. In celebration of National Poetry Month, we present today's conversation between Illinois Poet Laureate Angela Jackson, class of 1977, and editor and Northwestern University Press Director, Parnesha Jones. Angela Jackson is an award-winning poet, novelist, and playwright who has published three chapbooks and four volumes of poetry. Born in Greenville, Mississippi, and raised on Chicago's South Side, she was educated at Northwestern and the University of Chicago. Angela's collections of poetry include, And All These Roads Be Luminous, Poems Selected and New, which was nominated for the National Book Award, and It Seems Like a Mighty Long Time, which was nominated for the Pulitzer Prize and the Penn Open Book Award, and a finalist for the Hurston Wright Legacy Award and the Milt Kessler Poetry Prize. Angela received a Pushcart Prize and an American Book Award for her chapbook, Solo in the Boxcar, Third Floor E. Angela's forthcoming collection, More Than Meat and Raiment Poems, will be published by NU Press in 2022. Parnesha Jones is the author of Vessel Poems, winner of the Midwest Book Award and featured as one of 12 Books to Savor by O, the Oprah Magazine. Jones has been honored with the Gwendolyn Brooks Poetry Award, 
the Margaret Walker Short Story Award, and the Aquarius Press Legacy Award. Named one of the 25 Writers to Watch by the Guild Complex and one of Lit 50, who really books in Chicago, by New City Magazine, her work has appeared in anthologies, including She Walks in Beauty, A Woman's Journey Through Poems, and The Ringing Ear, Black Poets Lean South. Jones has been featured on PBS NewsHour, the Academy of American Poets, and ESPNW. And she's the director of NU Press. We hope that this is the first of many author talks presented by the NAA and the Northwestern Libraries. So please stay tuned for more details in future months. And now it gives me great pleasure to turn the program over to Parnisha and Angela. Thank you so much, Sandy. And I really just wanna say hello to everyone. I can't see everyone who is joining us this afternoon, but we're starting off Poetry Month. We're hoping for a new kind of spring in this pandemic. And I just wanna say, I hope everybody is well and safe in their quarters. I want to thank the alumni group. I wanna thank the library and I wanna thank the press for just really championing this event and bringing poetry to the forefront as it's been doing lately. And so it gives me the excuse to just be in the company of Angela Jackson, our new Illinois Poet Laureate. Angela, and she's wearing purple. How are you, Angela? Oh, I'm doing very well. Thank you so much. I'm just enjoying National Poetry Month. Yes. <laughs> Congratulations on your new appointment. We well, obviously are so proud. How are you feeling? I'm feeling good. Yeah. 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 Okay, good. I'm trying to do my job. <laughs> <laughs> so I have to kind of, this is a disclaimer. I have to kind of say that you were one of the first poets that I actually fell in love with. And I was 19 years old and I was trying to figure out what to do with my life, trying to figure out who I wanted to be. I feel like you and I have a connection because I wanted to be a doctor. And we'll talk a little bit about this later on because you started off as a pre-med major at Northwestern and you decided to be a poet. So I'm sure that went over really well in your family. That's like saying, I'm gonna join the circus. I'm gonna be a doctor, but instead I'm gonna join the circus. But at the same time, I was still on that path and I wanted to be a doctor. And then I discovered, you know, amazing writers like you. And so I feel the only way to do justice and just to show you how much I adore you is to read one of your poems. And this is my very favorite poem of yours. And this is from your book, And All These Roads Be Luminous. And the poem is called, The Mother Behaves Like a Young Woman with a Lover When Nat King Cole Comes on the Box. She takes off her run over shoes. She removes her re-run stockings. She unzips her re-hemmed skirt. She parts with her polyester blouse. She lies down on the sagging couch. Husband and children hide in the living room dark. The television glow slides over her slip like moonlight. Nat King Cole's glossed hair glistens like onyx. His voice shines in her eyes. She closes them. His songs in on the edges of her Mona Lisa smile. Midnight sighs over the silence of sleeping children. She sleeps on and on the sagging couch until husband invites her to his bed. His voice, newly tender, newly televised. You know, I'm so happy you chose that poem because 
it's uh, about my parents who recently I have decided are two of the most interesting people that I've ever known. Um, they, when I keep thinking about them, I think how, uh, how they are a unit, how they are together in my mind and how they complemented each other. And also I think of them as young people and how they set out to conquer this Chicago city together and how they uh, survived and thrived and, and raised children in a hostile place, but they made it work. I love that. I didn't know it was written about your parents, but you talked about strive and thrive and survive. How have you strived, thrived, survived in this pandemic state? Oh, wow. You know what? This pandemic is so uh, mind boggling that I can't even write a complete poem about it. The, all that I could write was, uh, it's something we could not see that brought the world to its knees, you know, and, and that it's just so overwhelming. Perhaps later I'll be able to, to, to take it into smaller bits and deal with it. But right now it's, it's just um, so hard to, to, to grasp. Uh, it's just, it's too much. You know, it's it's so interesting because I've talked to so many different writers, of course, authors, and you know, people assumed, especially folks in our field, the artists, the writers, that because we've been quarantined for the last year and in our spaces, that you know, we've basically written, I don't know, three novels, five poetry books, or something. And the more I talk to writers, they say, I have not been able to actually write in this, which makes complete sense. The whole world, I think, because of what we do and much of what we do is solitary anyway, assume that we were you know, in a really creative spate in, in terms of writing and producing. And most of the people I've talked to, yourself included, have not necessarily been able to write because we're trying to decipher a world that is obviously uncharted but changes every day and so do the question is do you actually want to write about this pandemic when we get on somewhat of the other side of it or would you like to just move on to something else what what I have been working on is something with my brothers and sisters we've been writing a collective memoir together different ones will write chapters and and we put we're putting it, it all together so that keeps us close to each other you know it keeps us from being uh in isolation and it keeps us happier remembering what what brought us through this life so far the, the, the strengths and the, the values that have carried us over. That's amazing because I was just um, suggesting with a couple of writer friends of mine, I wanted to start letter writing again. I mean, I know we live in the age of social media and all those different things, but a couple of us said, why don't we just write letters to each other? And so mm -hmm. what, I mean, I think it's a genius idea, a collective memoir between yes. six I don't think I've ever seen that before. So I'm putting my dibs in now as okay. you're that I want to see that when it's time okay. to publish. Okay. Yeah. So it's a lot of fun. Yeah. Let's talk a little bit about, you know, you write in so many different genres. You write in poetry, you write in theater, you write in fiction. Do you approach these in different ways as a writer or? How do, how do you know, first of all, what specific genre is something is going to be, but do you have a different ritual that you use for fiction versus poetry versus genre? Um, I just know uh, a sentence 
came to me the other day and I knew it was a part of the novel. I just, I just knew it. It was because it had characters with it. It, it, it had the potential of story with it. And it was, it just felt like it was a part of something longer with characters who had been here before or were going to go uh, a distance. So I knew it was a part of a novel. And uh, poems come when I can hear, I think music, uh, music or uh, an, an idea or an image that is uh, self-contained then I, I kind of know it's a poem. I can't figure out where, how I know something is a, a play. I'm trying to figure that out because I really would like to write another one. And I'm trying, I'm inclined to think that this COVID experience is going to be a play. Wow, okay, all right. I want to talk to you and again, I want to say congratulations on um, being appointed the Illinois uh, State Poet Laureate. Um, we have not had a black woman in this in this chair since Gwendolyn Brooks, and you were you were close to Miss Brooks. Miss Brooks was a major part of your life, and you also um, did the biography of Gwendolyn Brooks. And I just want to ask you, what did Gwendolyn Brooks, what effect did she have on your work and what effect is she gonna have on your tenure as Poet Laureate? Gwendolyn Brooks was a, a role model for me as a poet. And she was a role model to a lot of people because Gwendolyn Brooks was a genius. People are saying it now, but I had, I said it in print a few years ago when I did her biography. She was a genius. Um, what she did with language has had not been done. The way she represented African-American people with such love and care and truthfulness had not been done in exactly that womanly way. Now Langston Hughes did a great job of seeing us, but she added another dimension to it. Um, and what she saw in black people, she saw in all people. So by being faithful to her own experience, she was faithful to humanity. That is something that her critic George Kent said by going down into the specific, we arrive at the universal. And her being poet laureate first of uh, Illinois and then as a poetry consultant to the Library of Congress, she bought she brought everybody in when she was poetry consultant to the Library of Congress. She opened that up and she was generous with her time to everyone. So too was she generous with her time and money in both her uh, in her position as poet laureate. She created prizes for young people to get them excited about the writing poems and being getting uh, attention for their words, feeling, as she would say, reimbursed for what they did. Uh, and I'd like to do that for not just young people, because Illinois Humanities has continued in her tradition of young people, but also I'd like to continue with college age people and senior citizens. And, you know, because seniors have a lot to say and they're, they're not really paid attention to enough nowadays. So I wanna do that 
as well, and send ambassadors of poetry around to the schools to teach poetry to young people in elementary and high school, in community centers, in rehab centers, in libraries, in prisons, wherever people are congregated, I want to send four ambassadors of poetry to bring the living word of, of uh, poetry to everyone. Thank you. Thank you for that. You know, we were talking a little bit about, you know, I feel like anytime you and I get together, and now it's been almost, uh, what, two years now since we've seen each other. Um, <laughs> I, can, I, can, I can't wait to hug you in person. Um, but we were talking a little bit about how we just wanted to treat this like a porch. Like we're sitting on the porch in Mississippi. And of course I got my niece here saying all kinds of stuff, but I just wanted to say, say hi to my niece, Angela, you've been talking about her. So you get to see her now for the first time. Hi. Say hi. hi. Say hi. Bye-bye. Welcome to the Zoom world. My apologies. But I wanted to talk to you about, especially, I, thank you, talk about the idea of hearing all different voices and the idea of when you talked about bringing all voices ahead, the idea as an editor, I'm, I'm working with writers who are the oldest writer I'm working with right now is 102 and the youngest one is 24. Mm -hmm. And I don't think in any time in our literary world have we had this many generations of writers writing at the same time and having something to say. And mm -hmm. I wanted to really emphasize what you were saying because that really is important. I think for you as an artist, but also for me as an artist, but also for us as a press, we are looking at all the stories from all walks of life, of course, but there is a generational disconnect that has happened, especially in these times, especially with social media. And the fact that I was on a phone call one day and talking with somebody who was 102, and then a couple hours later talking to somebody 24, it just shows the breadth of the stories that we still need to tell. And so I hope with that, you wouldn't mind reading us a poem. Oh gosh. Oh, so, I know what. I'll know. read about coming, settling this city. Summer and the city, Chicago then, in memory of Robert Hayden and his memory. Summer nights, cool came down, blotting heat like a kiss for colored children. Heat surged as we danced jagged up and down the street, played hide and seek. Last night, night before, 24 robbers at my door. I got up, let them in, hit them in the head with a rolling pin. All hid among the leaves of church hedges, we smell something slow and splendid in our sweat. Our fathers we knew worked good jobs that required muscle. Our mothers in day work used elbow grease and unwritten receipts for smothered chicken and gravy. Angela, I think you're on mute. You're on mute. Oh God, I'm gonna go up. <laughs> Our fathers we knew worked good jobs that required muscle. Our mothers in day work used elbow grease and unwritten receipts for smothered chicken and gravy caused white women to envy and delight. Outside mothers waited for aid checks and the long gone man. Large women on folding chairs ate chunks of Argo starch. Lean days, sugar sandwiches, ketchup or mayonnaise, missing meat, a vague notion 
love manna. Twilight blessed the blocks poured from a dark man's mouth like a spout of Joe Lewis milk, our champion toast, heralding the greatest arrival, however long the getting there. Slow rocking grandmothers spit out words into small cans held in their hands. Their eyes trained on us from deep south porches we never left behind, never left us even after exodus. Mouths wide open, we drank the evening's pleasure, men, women, who loved us more than what we could have known. We were their quick flashing hope treasures, the memory of us, their milk, their honey. Thank you. So can you talk about the idea of, because I feel like you and I connect in so many different ways. And one of the things I love about your work is that you blend in Chicago and you blend in the South. And of course, a lot of that has to do obviously with the, the migration, the great migration. You know, I still hear the stories about the Pullman porters. We look at, you know, the artifacts that we had like Ebony and Jet magazine. Um, we look at, you know, just some of the key figures. When you think about people like Herb Kent, when you think about Curtis Mayfield, when you think about Chess Records, which was one of the most prominent record companies in Chicago that dealt with music and dealt with not just black music, but just, you know, music from the South and country music and combining that into blues and jazz. Can you talk about, do you ever see the South the American South and Chicago in different, in different ways? And if so, what are those ways? But you seem to so effort, effortlessly blend them together as if they're one unit. And is it one unit for you? I think that uh, my, where I'm from, the Mississippi Delta, at, 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 at a time, was very much like this, the, the block where I grew up on 55th and Wentworth, because most of the people from that block, on that block, were from Mississippi or Alabama. So it was very much, a, it had a Southern flavor to it because so many of the people were, were, were migrated from the South. And at the time, the South had very strong preserved traditions, there was a, a, a steadfast, steadfastness that had prevailed and held on. It's very different there now. The, unfortunately, it's the, even the South has changed and succumbed to the, the ills and poisons of contemporary time. Mm with drugs and, and HIV, uh, it, where, wherever you find poverty, you find those ills. And that's true of the South. When is the last time you've been down South? I haven't been down South since 2000. I went in 2010 to a, a, a conference uh, the time has come or the second one. And before that, I hadn't been there since my father's funeral in 1993. Well, speaking of your past, I want to talk about one work in particular, and it's not poetry. Um, but this is a work that uh, you are known for not only for how beautifully it's written, but for how long it took you to write this work. And it is your debut novel. And I, it took you 40 years to write this novel. So I think what I wanna say 
about the novel. And I'm hoping, Chris, if we can bring up the carousel, because we created a carousel of your books and kind of just talk a little bit. I, I want you to say a little bit, there's Dark Legs, Silk Kisses, which I just, I, I love the cover of that big book. Inspired poems. It took uh, nine years to write that. Took nine years to write that one. Uh, it's a meditation on a study of spiders and all of their mythic sense and how they uh, are viewed and in, in all over the world and mm -hmm. how they are a, a symbol of women, particularly black women mm -hmm. and also other women. And then this, and so the next one, so that's where I read the Nat King Cole poem, my favorite poem from. Yes, and all those are selected. Kind poems. of a collected, right? Collected yeah. works a little bit. Yeah, I don't know how long it took to write that because <laughs> it's selected. Okay, and the next one. So this is the first play that we published with you, Angela, and you wrote this back in the seventies, right? I started it in 1979 or 80. It was, uh, it came on the news, the story of a, a missing child that uh, came to a tragic end and that stayed with me. At the time, those kind of stories were very unusual, but they're more commonplace now. Uh, and I started writing it in um, what, in in the, what about 1980 and I, it was first done under the name when the wind blows i think in 1984 and then uh we it was redone in with with help from a, a dramaturge the great paul carter harris if he helped me really edit it down to uh, and in 1997, and then it was brought out again when I think you saw it in 2018. Mm -hmm. Edited, uh, directed by Cheryl Lynn Bruce. Yeah. Chris, the next one, please. This is the one where I think you and I really first worked together in a real way. And so I want to put this, I know I can't see everybody's faces on this event. I came to Angela as a person just wanting to know about poetry and thought I wanted to do something a little different with my life. And reading her work, I thought, I want to be a poet. She was one of the first poets who I saw that looked like me. And mm -hmm. between you and Gwendolyn Brooks and Margaret Walker and Tony Cade Bambara, I started to understand that women that looked like me or looked like women in my family could be literary figures among the Ernest Hemingways and the Philip Roths and the Shakespeare's and all those kinds of things. I found you all and that gave me a certain permission to say, I think I wanna be part of this world. Mm -hmm. When I became an editor at Northwestern, I became your editor. So this is a very round, mm -hmm. like poet <laughs> Mickey Finney says, the world is round. And so you did something for me and we came back around together. This was the first book that you and I worked on at length. And when I say at length, we literally sat in a Herald's chicken shack going poem by poem. I mean, that is truly the most Southern, probably blackest thing you can do is sit in a chicken joint and go through poetry. <laughs> but this is the first collection that I worked on you with in 2015 when I became, when I became the poetry editor. And so can you talk about this? Because not only is it a beautiful um, image, that's a Jonathan Green image, who is a, a artist from South Carolina, but this was 15 years after your last poetry book. Yeah, it took an Ann Gindler, who also is one of my editors, said, told me that I was going to have to uh, write faster. <laughs> <laughs> what did it mean for you to have something, a poetry book to come out 15 years after your last one? Because it was after all these roads be luminous and all these roads be luminous, right? Mm -hmm. uh, 
It was nominated for Hurston Wright NAACP Award, a Penn Award. How'd you feel about that? I felt really good about it. I was wishing that it had won one of them, but <laughs> <laughs> yet to be nominated for all of those was pretty remarkable. Yeah. <laughs> oh gosh, you know, a lot of these poems, uh, yeah, these poems took a while to write because some of them were written in like 1991. One of them I see was written in 1980, 85. Yeah. So these took a long time too. It seems like a mighty long time. That's okay. I'll wait forever. Yeah. yeah. As long as you bring the brilliance. Chris, but, the next but more than me and Raymond is fast because uh, a section of that was started in 2001, and then another section was 2010, and then another section was 2012. So that's really kind of fast for me. It yeah, is. it is. I'm here for it, though. Chris, the next one, please. So this is the novel that I was hinting towards. This is the novel that took you 40 years, Angela, to write, yes? Yeah, I started that novel. I was I was a slide assistant, you know, in those days in 1969-70, when a, when a visual arts instructor or professor showed his or her work, they didn't have the machines where you just clicked it on to the next slide. They had to have a person who stood at the back of the classroom and changed the slides. So I changed slides for uh, Jeff Donaldson. And I remember standing there as I changed one slide and I was thinking, and I was looking at these wonderful uh, visuals. And I remember thinking, I'm gonna write the story of my generation, my time, and my people, I'm going to write that story. And that was in the winter of 69. And I started writing then. Uh, so I started writing little pieces. I took uh, cre two creative writing courses at Northwestern, one with Elliot Anderson, another with Peter Michelson, and wrote little bits of fiction in that. And I wrote more fiction at Obasi, but I didn't read fiction at Obasi. I just slowly over time collected bits and pieces of, of the novel and then started learning how to write chapters in about, oh, 73 or 74. And then I wrote short stories and that were part of it in 77. So I slowly learned how to write chapters and, and to make a whole thing. By the middle of the 80s, I had something by the middle of the 80s, the end of the 80s, uh, the beginning of the 90s, I had a draft. And then I began sending it around and getting really good criticism. And I also got useless criticism. And I had the sense not to use the useless criticism and to, to use the useful criticism. You know, uh, useful criticism was you don't have enough plot. You, you know, plot is causal. One thing makes another thing happen. So I didn't have enough of that. So I had to learn how to do that. And I did over time. So uh, in With 2001, I sent it to Northwestern University Press and it never got read. And finally, Susan Bitts, who was editor at that time, was able to get somebody to read it. And I finally signed a contract in 2006. And it came out in 2009. And this particular um, novel, it's loosely based off of your time at Northwestern yes. as undergrad. Oh, uh, one other thing I need to add. Mm -hmm. I had help with the editing. 
Reginald Gibbons, who yeah. was head of the writing center at you know, who's director of the writing at Northwestern was like my editor, my unofficial editor on where I must go. He helped me shape that. He told me, you need another chapter here. You need to do this. And I did, I did that. We had one long phone uh, session where he gave me good uh, guidance on what to do, yeah. Well, it, it just goes to show, obviously, having good people look at your work, but also giving yourself the time to produce something that you feel happy with and you want to put out into the world. But this is based off of your time at Northwestern as an undergraduate. Magdalena, the, the main character, I want to talk about her a little bit, just at least ask you the question, because it took you, you know, this time to bring that novel out in 2009. Can you talk about that? And can you talk about if Magdalena's experience is actually relevant right now? Because she was part of the black arts movement. She was part of the civil rights movement. Does that speak to now, especially with the whole idea of what goes on in the conversations of the world, but right here at Northwestern, how we want to be and move forward? Yes, yes, it does. I, I think it does. I think if, if Maggie were a college student nowadays, she'd be very active in the Black Lives Matter movement. And she'd be marching uh, just as Maggie did. But I, I, I must say, I was not a part of the takeover at Northwestern. And I don't want people to think that I'm suggesting that I was because I don't want to take any, anybody else's experience. I deliberately did not ask anybody who participated in the takeover any questions about it because I wanted them to tell their own story and I hope they will tell it uh, when they can. Mm. But so there were a lot of student takeovers in 68. Mm. You know, that wasn't it just at Northwestern. They were at several institutions, including Howard University. They were taking over uh, campuses, uh, administration buildings, yeah. Chris, we'll go to the next one, please. So this is the continuation of Magdalena's story in so many ways, because you wrote this almost as a trilogy, An Angela. We haven't yet to see the, the last part of this. But what does that mean for you in terms of the continuation? I mean, it's, you're a writer, obviously you're a poet, you're a playwright, you're a novelist, you're all these different things, but you have to continue some of these stories. It seems like you pick up some stories that you wrote about either a long time ago or just recently. How did it feel to pick up on the second part of Magdalena's story? Well, actually, I wrote it all as one long book. And it was like book one, book two of the same book. And they wouldn't publish it as one book. They said, you had to break this up. So I said, that's fine with me, because it was already book one and book two. So <laughs> it came in as a 1000 pages, I believe, right? Yes, yes. Yeah. So for all the would-be writers out there who are part of this event and this experience, it could take a year or it could take 40 years, but it's about the experience. It's about the quality of the work and you stuck with it. Can you yeah. tell me, can you answer one question? Why did you go from being a pre-med major at Northwestern to go- I did not do well as a pre-med major. And the other thing is I wanted to be a writer before I wanted to be a doctor then that's the truth. I want to be a, a writer when I was 10 or 11, because I want to be a writer like Louisa May Alcott. And, um, and, and then I um, was influenced by Dr. Tom Dooley, a missionary in Africa, and Benita Younger in A Raisin in the Sun, <coughs> who were doctors or wanted to be doctors. And I switched uh, my, my interest, and I scored really high in natural science reading, not so great in math, I was just average in math, but I did really well in natural science reading. So uh, 
I had some potential to be a doctor, but I just didn't have it. And I didn't have the, the interest when I got to Northwestern. All I wanted to do was write poems and read poems from Black poetry. That's all I wanted to do. So. I'm right there with you. I wanted to do it. And then I saw the sight of blood and I was like, no, I don't think I can do this. Actually, I'd rather do poetry. We're going to shift over to questions. You have a slew of people who want to ask you questions. So we're going to go into that. And I think uh, Claire is going to help us out with the questions. Claire, are you there? I am. Um, we have a lot of questions um, live here from the audience and some questions that were sent to us in advance. Um, and there were quite a few questions that came in um, about Obasi. So I'm going to kind of combine a couple of these and just could you elaborate um, more about the importance and the influence of Obasi and specifically you mentioned George Kent. Can you talk a little bit more about him and his impact on you? Uh, it wasn't George Kent who had a, a real impact on me. It was Hoyt Fuller, who was a visiting professor at Northwestern, who my roommate, Roella Henderson, suggested I show him my poetry, and I did. He was the editor of Negro Digest Black World, and uh, he suggested that I come to Obasi, and uh, I did, and I stayed for over 20 years. And uh, I was there with Haki Mazaguri, who at the time was Don L. Lee, Carolyn Rogers, Jahari Amini, Walter Bradford, and they were all directly mentored by Gwendolyn Brooks, my role model. And we would have visitors to Obasi, like Nikki Giovanni, Sonia Sanchez, Etheridge Knight, Mari Evans, uh, uh, Carol Petsy, Coach Cecily, uh, another Obasi member, Sterling Plump. So um, Obasi wanted to create a literature that was to, for, and from, and about Black people directly out of our experience, unapologetically Black. Thank you. Um, You're welcome. We were speaking, you guys got into talking about letters and old ways of writing earlier. Um, one of our uh, viewers says, I'm curious to know how much technology has shifted how both of you write and what you write and your process and what has not changed despite technology and given your vast experience over time. Um, would each of you care to talk a little bit about technology and your process? I still have to write everything down long form. So I have a lot of paper and I still have a lot of paper. I will always have a lot of paper. I appreciate the fact that I can get everything on a computer. I appreciate that I have my iPhone, but I have to, I have to see my own handwriting in order for me to understand what I'm trying to write. I also keep a tape recorder in my car and I keep a tape recorder on my nightstand because most of the time the most prolific or what I think is prolific happens when I'm in a dream state. And now I've learned to just still be half asleep and press record and talk. Now the next day, it's a whole different situation. I'm not sure most of it actually makes sense, but the whole idea of what media means, it really comes down to what you feel comfortable doing. And I think especially in this time when we have everything available to us in terms of technology and media, it's really just seeing my own handwriting that makes me closer to my work. So that's me. I write in handwriting too. I write longhand as well. And then I put it on the computer. Yes. And, and, and uh, by the way, I'm just learning how to use social media. My niece is teaching me. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome aboard the crazy train. Um, let's see. Uh, shifting, uh, shifting gears a little bit here. Uh, we had a question about, uh, I'll, I'll just read it off. Could Ms. Jackson please mention some poems that relate to crisis? And I'm interpreting that, I think, perhaps meaning social crisis. And also name some crisis poems from others. Um, I, 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 my response to that was, I have written a, like a 12 page poem that, that, 
that goes from like 2012 to 2019. And it's about the murders of uh, black men and women by mostly uh, police, but some just plain racist people. And it's called the Red Record after Ida B. Wells, a red record, which was a record of lynchings. Um, I'm, I'm collecting poems to use for my ambassadors of poetry. And one that I found that interests me was by Martine Espada, Letter to My Father, which is about the hurricanes that ravaged Puerto Rico and uh, the response of the president throwing paper towels at, out into the crowd of the people. Those are just uh, two examples that I can uh, offer, though a lot of people are have written a lot of uh, political poems, especially within the last uh, four or five years. Thank you. Um to both of you, what's your point of view on poetry that crosses genres into visual or performance art? You mean spoken word? Uh, I suppose that was, those were the words that were sent in as the question. And I think spoken word is perhaps how I'd interpret that, um, or perhaps um, it brought into maybe plays or brought into, um, uh, fine art. Uh, I'm, I'm guess I'm thinking uh, visual art. I, I like it. I have a niece, Imani Elizabeth Jackson, who is a poet who does do that multi-genre uh, work of, of that is performed. It's not exactly spoken word, but it's like little mini plays of, of poems and and movement and and storytelling at the same time. I, I kind of like it. I like the surprises of it. I like when people experiment. I was just looking at a, a spoken word, a young man, Samuel Hawkins, doing spoken word from Carbondale. And it, it was interesting to me. Yeah. I, don't, I, I wouldn't do it, but I, I like it when other people do. <laughs> I, I would agree with Angela. I mean, one of the things I can speak as an editor, um, but also as a writer is I love poetry that captures other genres and moves into other worlds. I think the poetry of all the genres can easily move into other spaces and other genres. We've done a book of visual poetry, all visual poetry by Avery R. Young called Neckbone. We, um, one of the books that we're coming out right now with a poetry collection, um, by Kevin Simmons called The Monster That I Am, where he takes on the alter ego of Leotine Price, one of the greatest black opera singers. And so it combines poetry and music. We've had poetry and photography. Poetry is, is in vogue right now. And it's one of the things that has been lended into so many spaces, not just artistic spaces. I mean, when you see poetry in vogue, which I'm still trying to get my head wrapped around that, it, it is one of the most um, resilient genres, I think, in, in the literary community. And so I, I love to see when writers want to take the risk to combine poetry with other aspects of either artistic um, expression, but also social justice and activism. Um, we're looking at poetry and science, poetry and journalism. I mean, there's so many different things that have not been fleshed out that the world is waiting to see. So. I'm all for it. And I also want to address your last question, Claire. See, I have books all over my house. This is called Being Human. It's an anthology that is an anthology of poems that are poems about unreal times. So it's a trilogy of uh, anthologies, but this is Being Human. And I think that that might address the last question if the person is looking for some poems that specifically speak to that particular area of, you know, interest. Thank you. Um, this is a question uh, and from Dante Michaud. Uh, he writes, one of the great benefits of having studied with you, Ms. Jackson, is that one receives poetry and history, the lessons in tandem. 
In your work with younger generations of poets, what's the one thing we lack in comparison to your generations of poets? That's an unfair advantage. I haven't, I, I, I haven't read enough of you guys yet. It's not, um, I'm not as familiar with all of you yet. I'm slowly diving in and I hope to be soon caught up. I, I, I remember thinking there are so many poets now. How am I ever going to get caught up? Uh, I do know that I'm thinking of two younger poets that I know, two were students of mine, um, Douglas Kearney and uh, Ahmad Jamal Johnson were students of mine at, at Howard. Um, they're both very intellectual. I noticed they're both very intellectual and I don't wanna say that they're not passionate, but they could be more passionate. And I'm not gonna say that, uh, that's something that I would tell them to their face. So I'm not saying anything out of, out of turn. I think they could be more passionate or even, I think passion and Compassion are things that are increased with age. So I, I think that that may be the case. Thank you. I think that's a great answer. And to any um, of the younger generation of poets who's on this call, perhaps you can send your suggested readings to Ms. Jackson's uh, new social media accounts since she's new to social media. <laughs> Please, um, literary Angela. And also, I do want to say to Dante and Michelle, thank you for the lovely bouquet. I was thinking of you the other day, thinking how I want to get in touch with you. And thank you for the bouquet you sent me that I never thanked you for. <laughs> Well, is that, I think this is just a great forum to get such a shout out. Um, we have time for one more question before we turn it back over to Sandy Riggs to close out our program today. So the last question um, says, Angela or Parnisha or both of you, do you recall or were you present at the poetry presentation by Muhammad Ali at Northwestern in 1971 on the evening before his Supreme Court vindication? He presented a collection aimed at young people in Chicago specifically. If so, in what ways did it influence you? So I can, I, my answer is very short before I let you go um, because I wasn't born until 1980. So I wasn't there, but I'm gonna go look this up and research it, absolutely. And, but no, I was not, I was not present at that time, but I now- I wasn't there I either and I was there, but I wasn't there. <laughs> even know about it <laughs> or I don't remember it. Yeah. Well, I think that gives us all some something in really interesting to uh, go look up and, and certainly an interesting to collection to go and find. Um, and now I uh, will turn it over to Sandy to close out our program. Thank you, Claire. And thanks again to Angela and Parnisha for a really delightful and engaging conversation. And on behalf of the Northwestern Libraries, I'd also like to thank Jenna and the NAA and to all of our attendees for being here for today's presentation. Please keep in touch and look for our next author talk in uh, a few months. And thank you to all and be well. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you. Sandy, should we stay on?